Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk on reaction diffusion. Um, yeah, reaction diffusion is a funny little um, type of simulation that it was first invented by um, Alan Turing, actually, who was you know the one of the fathers of modern computing. Um, and um, it's a really interesting, somewhat fringe little kind of um, type of solving. Um, and I'll get into some of the um, some of the how it works bit in a second, um, but um, I've been rather into it for um, some years now, and experimenting with it and editing. Well, there's lots of different formulas that all come under the umbrella of reaction diffusion. The most famous or popular one is probably something called Gray-Scott reaction diffusion. It's a funny thing that it's at the intersection between a rather academic kind of um, realm and something that's just a bit more fun and creative way of synthesizing textures or and motion as well. Um, and it has lots of other interesting applications too. Um, but so if you look at this um, slide, this is what happens when the words reaction diffusion go through um, a few iterations of something I made up in Houdini um, and a little bit more. Um, it does this kind of making things a bit more organic if you do it to shapes. Um, but yeah, so what is it? Um, and this, you see some examples here of just a couple of things from little captures from simulations I've done. We'll see some moving versions of things like that a bit later on. Um, so it's, what is it? It's a, and then, oh, I shouldn't read this out. I'm not meant to read, um, read what I've written here because it's a bit of a jarring to hear, hear and read at the same time. But basically it's this, either voxels or points. Um, and they can be a grid of them or um, on the surface of an object or filling space or um, lots of different ways of um, setting up the substrate for the simulation to run on. Um, and what you see here in yellow is the um, what you call the neighborhood of the of each individual cell. So you've got one, uh, two cells on the left with a small neighborhood and a larger neighborhood, and uh, one cell on the right there, which is more meant to represent what it would be like for a point cloud. Um, and it's just the neighbors that are nearest to that cell. So um, like most types of simulation, um, reaction diffusion, it feeds the previous state um, back in to create the next state, sort of what you'd probably expect. Um, and so it's in a realm sort of similar to, um, like from a more academic point of view, the Con John Conway's Game of Life, which is a, um, an example from a, a thing called 2D Totalistic Cellular Automata, basically a little rule that lets you transform a cell and its neighbor values into the next state of the cell. Um, pretty straightforward for Conway's Game of Life because you've only got black and white. Um, but for reaction diffusion, the values of the cells are, can be floating point and they can have, there can be more than one. And what they represent is um, concentrations of chemicals is the idea. Um, and you can have more than one layer of that. So you can have multiple reagents. They're called reagents because they represent chemicals in the simulation. Um, and usually there will be um, using some kind of continuous sampling of the neighborhood to, um, to produce the next state. The Laplacian operator is the most common, uh, which is sort of like a blur. Um, but there are also lots of other ways of transforming the neighborhood of values into a smooth kind of next value for use in the remainder of the formula. Oh, here's a little diagram of what the connectivity between, so if you say on the left is the previous frame and on the, on the right is the next frame. So it's fairly dense in terms of the connectivity between the cells if you draw it all out, um, but um, nowhere near as dense as something like a neural network or something where any cell can be connected to any other number of cells. Um, yeah. So, and so a reaction diffusion sim, ah, oh, sorry, my text is under my, under my picture there, sorry about that. Um, it defines a formula um, which tells you how to combine the Laplacian with the reagent values to produce the next um, value for the cell. Um, so you see a couple of examples here, and this is from a, these are screen captures from a software called Ready, um, which is a um, open source software, um, multi-platform, 
um, that you can go and download from GitHub or whatever um, that um, simulates uh, reaction diffusion things using OpenCL. Most of the types of things it does support OpenCL, so you get a bit of hardware acceleration to make the simulation go a little bit faster. Uh, and on the left, you see the um, Grayscott formula. So that's pretty compact. Uh, just basically has a little place in it, a, um, a little nonlinear term, the ABB bit, and uh, another bit for, the, um, for telling it basically how much A produces B and B produces A kind of thing. And on the right, you can see um, a bigger formula. This is something I developed where I coupled, um, I added a few more reagents to the simulation. And um, basically, one of the, I used one of the reagents to represent the sort of history of where the other reagents have been. And then I used the other reagents to implement something called the wave equation, um, which there's an already an example of that in ready. So I basically just bolted those two things together. <clears throat> and um, so I call it Gray Scott with history and wave. That's just my name for it. But that's led to some quite interesting kind of uh, experimental simulations. Um, so the other thing you need to get going with reaction diffusion is an initial state for all the reagents. If you start from constant, it will never do anything. Um, so a lot of um, initial states will be um, things like different ranges of random numbers um, and that kind of thing. But in Ready, you can also just paint on the different reagents to um, try and get the simulation going. So these are just two examples of um, that gray Scott with history and wave um, that um, I use to get some of my rules going. I know it looks like not much, but that's just an example of what a, how many strokes I needed to do to like try that, no, that didn't work, try that, no, that didn't work. Like it's quite sensitive to get the simulation started sometimes. It's difficult to uh, guarantee that it will actually get rolling. Um, but yeah, that's just an example of what it might look like after you've twiddled it for a while. Um, so that is a reaction diffusion. The image on the left is a reaction diffusion um, simulation I um, made in Houdini based on a model that my friend Ben Paschke from Rose and Sun gave me. Um, and let's have a look at some examples of um, where you see reaction diffusion like patterns in nature. Because that was the original inspiration when Alan Turing made it up. He was looking at a cow and he's like, how does the cow have white and black blobs on it? What makes that happen? And he didn't have a computer uh, and he made up the um, this rule for a simulation and he just crunched the numbers himself. I mean, he was a genius, so of course he can probably do that relatively easily. Um, but um, yeah, he actually got results by hand from his reaction diffusion uh, simulation. So um, we see things like these spots and this cool image of this crazy blue fish. It's got a combination of stripes and spots. Um, and that can be um, something where if you want to apply reaction diffusion to a um, visual effects scenario, or maybe it's like a character um, texturing type scenario, um, you can do things where you produce a mask to modulate the parameters of the reaction diffusion before you run it. Or it can change while the sys simulation is running as well, if you like. Um, so I thought that looked pretty cool and it's nice and reaction diffusion-y. Um, on the left, we've got this fish which has also sort of dotty, but um, you'll note that it's got more of a Voronoi cell, <coughs> like hexagonally kind of sharp-edged cell look about it. On the right, this fish has, again, modulation of the, the type of reaction diffusion patterns that you're seeing with it stripy on the base and then spotty at the top. Um, and reaction diffusion can also be used to generate 3D shapes. So you can sort of start from a seed geometry and um, initialize it with an initial state that hopefully gets the simulation going. Again, that's rather a difficult thing to guarantee, but um, you, so you find an initial state which will get it going. And then you can um, make it so that the geometry is modified by the, um, the values that the simulation is producing and say it deforms itself. So it might um, push out in areas where the, the A reagent is high, say. And then as time goes on, and then usually you'll need to sort of remesh the geometry or resample the curve so that you've got um, more points or more voxels or whatever it is to work with on the next iteration. 
Um, so these two things, you can definitely um, use reaction diffusion to produce these types of structures. Um, the branching on the right there um, is um, when you see some examples, actually I'm not sure I've got an example of this, but reaction diffusion frequently has um, this one, Gray Scott has a thing where a soliton will split into two solitons and then sub and subsequently those solitons will split. It looks a bit like bacteria dividing. And if you can imagine this running on the tips of this coral as it grows, it's like the dot at the tip of the growth can split into two dots and that'll create a branch in the growth. Um, and we got this cool stingray, and there's a goanna, which is an in interesting one, because uh, when um, reptiles and so on, they have scales, and the patterns then usually expressed within each scale. So you can see the individual scales have taken on um, a bit of pigment um, differently across the, across the goanna, but um, still in a kind of reaction fusion-y way. Um, oh yeah, and this is a cool example. This sharky thing on the left, you can even see the dots dividing. If you're familiar with this type of um, Gray-Scott reaction diffusion, the, these places where, the, where you can see the two dots adjacent to each other, it's really a giveaway that it actually is using something that's very similar to that reaction diffusion system um, to generate its code. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's kind of, um, it, was, it was theoretical for a while, but it's now known that um, biological systems do use um, some mechanisms that are basically completely analogous to um, what reaction diffusion models. Um, so it's, it's plausible to suggest that that is using a reaction diffusion system directly. And, and this is um, also known to be um, really important as part of morphogenesis, which is where, where an embryo, embryo develops. So um, if you start from the single-celled fertilized um, zygote, whatever it is, um, you can imagine that a reaction fusion, well, the first thing that happens is it has to figure out the head from the tail end, and that is a, a system where there will be some slight variations in some morphogen, which is a, just a chemical that it, the body is making. So there's slight variations, and then um, there's a system within the biology which basically um, tries to suggest, tries to figure out which ends the head end, which ends the tail end, and then, so one of the cells will have, because it's random, one of the cells will have slightly more head end, and that will inhibit the tail end chemical from surrounding um, around that area. And over time, it'll eventually set up this gradient across the, I guess it's multicellular by then. Um, it'll set up this gradient of the morphogen across the, um, across the ball of cells. And then from then on, the cells can know where they are in, within the embryo by basically reading that, that value. So it's a bit like UV mapping, if you like. <laughs> Puffer fish on the right. And that thing's pretty fancy looking. It's also got lots of nice variation and different colors and things from its pattern. Um, on the left, that's actually a coral. Um, I've generated some geometry very similar to this in Houdini by using reaction diffusion on a curve and basically, like I was describing, pushing out the curve where, where one reagent is high. And then on the right, some kind of mushroom, which also has a sort of um, web-like reaction diffusion-y quality about it, plants as well, um, and that bottom right one, I took that one when I was in the Botanic Gardens preparing a few weeks ago, I was like, that's reaction diffusion, I'm putting it in my talk. <gasps> Snakes, and I thought the frog was interesting because that's uh, not just colour, it's like actually affecting the shape of the, of the frog or toad or whatever it is. Uh, on the left is some kind of cowrie shell, a mollusk. Um, which I thought was really interesting because it looks very, very much like a, um, some types of reaction diffusion you can simulate. And another cowrie shell on the right there as well. That's a spotted quoll and a cheetah. These are pretty common. Well, cheetah especially is a very common example to cite as a why would you use reaction diffusion to texture a creature. Um, so what types of sims in Houdini are like this? Um, just in spirit, not like in terms of what they can generate. Um, and so I guess the erosion simulation is a bit like it because it's um, 2D grid of cells and involves some neighborhood operations where you're filtering the surrounding values and you're putting them through some rules to try and um, generate the next state. Um, and also pyro. Um, is a little bit like it too, 
Um, this is a, not actually 2D pyro on the right there, but a, just a very thin box, um, uh, which is tuned to um, sort of have a smooth kind of wave front that moves out across the um, simulation using up the fuel and producing the density. And um, you can kind of conceptualize reaction diffusion as being a bit like that combustion reaction, but if you were to be able to close the loop and feed back some future state of the simulation to produce more fuel so that it can keep going around the loop, um, the reaction diffusion, um, evolution of reaction diffusion is a bit like this progression between different, different concentrations of these chemicals that can form a closed loop. Um, and you can also do it, so um, you can do a very simplified version of reaction diffusion by doing um, two blurs of different sizes. So if you do one blur of a regular sort of size, a bit blurry, and then do, do another blur that's much larger, and you sort of um, compute the difference in the values between those two um, different neighborhood sizes, and then you can either like use that directly as the next state, or you can add that to the current state to kind of create the evolution. Um, just some cool examples with Piggy and uh, the model I got from Ben, um, which I thought was pretty sweet. Um, and this is an example of what reaction diffusion specifically isn't like. So it doesn't have anything in it that um, explicitly moves values from one place to another. All, all the motion comes from the diffusion. So um, in order for a dot to move, it's got to basically, the front's got to blur out and the back, something's eating the back in to sort of make it slowly inch its way across the space. Um, so diffusion, because a lot of these reaction diffusion things are what's well, called reaction diffusion, and that's because the Laplacian is so fundamental to um, so many of the different types of reaction diffusion. Um, and many, most reaction diffusion things have multiple reagents, so even Grace Scott has two, um, but you can get quite a lot of interesting phenomena just with a single reagent. What you're seeing here are lots of examples of a thing called boiling heat, which is, if you imagine the, lands the initial landscape of values, you're continuously blurring this landscape of values and also adding a tiny bit to it on every solver substep, and when it reaches some threshold, it jumps down to a much lower value. So you get this soft peaks rising and smoothly blurring out, and then when they reach some threshold, you get this massive valley forming in them. And that is actually a discontinuity that makes this potentially um, a bit less useful, because it is a bit aliasy because of those hard edges you get, because it is an if that says, if you're greater than some threshold, jump right back down. Um, but I guess you probably could work out some way of making that a bit more continuous. I haven't tried to play with that yet. Um, yeah, I'm, there's more something I find interesting and that I'm planning to play with, um, but Penny Backer, there's a, a researcher called Penny Backer in 2013, um, put out a paper where they um, showed this reaction diffusion system, which is a single reagent. So this is just a single array of float values that has, a, has the rule that they um, discovered or made. Um, and it's a model for um, auxin, um, auxin transport. Auxin is a, is a hormone that plants produce that um, helps plants know how to grow sort of thing. So it'll be involved in the way plants split and where the branches come out and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, if you're interested in that, it's in, there's an example in, um, in Ready. Um, yeah, so adding um, the wave equation is actually a really interesting thing in and of itself. It's um, if you take the bi Laplacian, which is basically the Laplacian of the Laplacian, um, and you make the, um, the values evolve based on that, it will give you a ripply kind of behavior. And this is something um, that I, I actually ripped out of my ready setup and took to work. And we've used it successfully on several subsequent projects to do ripple in Houdini, to do ripple-like dynamics um, in Houdini. And it's really um, quite tolerant because it's based on diffusion. Um, it's quite tolerant. You can even have a completely 
remeshing surface on every frame and just use attribute transfer. Like, well, usually it helps as well to do that thing where there's hopefully there's velocities on your remesh, like say so it's a fluid surface or something and the mesh is completely different on every frame. So there's velocities. So if you can um, move the previous frame's geometry forward along V a bit and the next frame's geometry back along V a bit till they're a bit closer to each other and then do the attribute transfer, um, that's sort of just to minimize the amount of blur, just to control it a little bit. But um, this, um, the wave equation can totally work in that scenario and it's not really hurt that much by the fact that it's a little bit blurry because it's sort of built into it. Um, oh yeah, this is an interesting one. So this is something called the BZ, or the, yeah, the belusov zabotinsky reaction, which is one of the earliest um, chemical reactions that was discovered that actually produces patterns, um, like it self-organizes. So initially it's just all these chemicals all stirred up together, and um, then these pulse-like waves will form and spread out along the um, Petri dish, for example. Uh, and then you're seeing on the left a photo of that, and on the right, this is the BZ model from Ready. Another interesting one, well, um, not all reaction diffusion things are models of chemicals. Some of them are models of things that are more like physics. Um, this complex Ginsberg-Landau reaction diffusion, uh, there's quite, um, there's some examples of that in Ready as well. Uh, and that give it's some, I don't know the details of it really, but it's related to um, aspects of physics and quantum physics. Um, but it gives you these wonderful spiral waves that I wish I could show you them in motion. You can check out my YouTube channel. Um, but they they propagate out and interact with each other. This the one in the middle there. These these dots have these wicked um, spirally waves that come out of them, and the dots kind of interact with each other in interesting ways. Well worth playing with if you're into this sort of stuff. And there's another one called Perwin's Glider, um, which has lots of moving features, so that the dots in Perwin's Glider don't stay still. They tend to propagate out along the space, or there might be wave fronts as in the middle and right images here. Um, there's also funny things like smooth life, That's sort of the middle upper there. Um, people decided they wanted to try and get something that was rather like game of life, as in John Conway's game of life, um, to um, work in, um, in reaction diffusion. Smooth life is an example of that. There's also um, the bottom left is uh, something called Schrodinger, which is uh, actually implementing the Schrodinger equation in Ready. And uh, that, this is showing an example of tunneling, quantum tunneling, um, implemented from first principles. McCabe is a fractal one on the right there. And so one thing that's really good with direction diffusion, because it's a multi-dimensional parameter space, it's rather difficult to, um, to get, find your way around. But what you see on the right there is a map of the Grayscott parameter, parameter space, so you can Look at that and know, if you want to get dots, you can look where the dots are and um, go and type in the values for the parameters for the dots to get that behavior from the simulation. That's one of the nicest things about Grayscott reaction diffusion. There's um, a Grayscott reaction diffusion simulation running on um, the rubber toy in Houdini. And this is running using the um, polygon mesh connectivity as the neighborhood. Um, and you can, oh, it's both, I've covered up the text there. Both are highly multi-threaded multi in VEX, so you can get some pretty high performance um, from this, just even just using VEX. Um, yep, talked about that. So motion can be based on diffusion. Oh, yes, so I hope this video is on the next slide. Sorry, I fixed my talk this morning. Um, you can add, add, because that tolerance to being filtered, um, you can um, add VEX reaction diffusion um, and it will um, still work pretty good. Tricky little test, but that's cool. That's made in Houdini with a volume primitive, so it's a 2D volume primitive that's running behind that. This is on this image is showing you reaction diffusion running on a curve, what I was describing before, where the curve gets repeatedly deformed and resampled. And this has a point cloud trail behind it as well, so you can surface if you want to do that. That's the network on the right. Um, there's another example of deforming a curve, repeatedly deforming a curve which has a reaction diffusion simulation running on it. 
um, and then rendering it with some nice glows and things in Mantra. This one, I use direction diffusion on um, some surfaces um, and use it to make this nice little mushroomy thing. Here's, the, um, here's some curvature masks being used um, to modulate a reaction diffusion system on the SEER model that Ben gave me. So you can see it's all rainbowy around the high curvature areas. And that can extend to um, having masks that vary as time progresses as well. So you can make it respond to like collide with things and that sort of thing as well. Um, on the left, you can see the main VOPS um, Grayscott formula. Perhaps you could argue that might be a bit shorter and easier to read in VEX, fair enough. There's a for loop that's running it on the right. This is what the Laplacian looks like in VOPS, pretty straightforward. Just the sum of differences between neighbors, Laplacian is quite, quite easy to, to do. Um, ready, as I mentioned before, it's available on all platforms, well, all, all the main platforms, um, and you can compile it. Um, well, this binary is available, and you can go and build it yourself. I um, have also contributed some source to Ready, um, which was a prior, um, oh, so that's later on. Um, I'll get to that. Um, this is about the extending Gray Scott. So what you're seeing here is the history reagent that I was talking about before. So you can see as a point moves, it leaves this blurry trail behind it. And sometimes when the points move along wiggly paths, as, bottom, as in bottom right there, you get more interesting sort of corally shapes at the, at the wave fronts. Um, this is the wave equation component of several um, reaction diffusion systems, sometimes quite ripply, sometimes a little bit less ripply, or just trail kind of thing. And here are some examples of, um, of the whole thing, well, other examples of Ray Scott with history and, ray, and wave. Um, and some more. And some more. Now, better hurry it up a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting, fertile ground for experimenting with different um, simulations. And this is a formula that I wrote myself, um, which treats two reagents as a complex number and applies the Mandelbrot slash Julia orbits fractal formula to advance time. Um, and that was just a guess. I was just like, oh, I'll try that. And then added heaps of little tweaky parameters to sort of really allow you to explore and got some very interesting different types of behaviors from that. Um, some of them are distributed with ready. Oh, wow. Lots of those, lots of interesting wave fronts with kind of sometimes fractally, like that bottom right one's quite sort of fractally feeling. Um, so the first time I, um, I wrote a plugin in SOPS, which was basically a read-only adapter that read ready simulations into Houdini. Um, Proof of concept, really. But I used that to do, um, I made that because um, in Ready, you can only record quantized PNG sequences from Ready, and that's really not going to cut it for if you want to use it for displacement kind of thing. Um, uh, so it um, was also had horribly complicated build time dependencies. I think I'm probably the only person that ever built that in the world because it was so tricky. Um, and you could only read three reagents back in. Um, go away, that thing. Um, that's another example of the orbit reaction, reaction diffusion um, rule running on a sort of mirror surface in uh, rendered with Mantra. Um, so that was a huge advancement, but um, the new one, uh, the new thing I'm working on, and well, there is a version in the Ready repo, is a thing called RDY Houdini, which is which I decided to try and break the um, binary linkage problem and just call the command line version of Ready to extract the formula and everything, then just munge all of that text in Python and put it into gas open seal dots in Houdini to, um, to do the simulation in, in gas open seal in Houdini. So this is what this is. You can go and check that out on the um, GitHub for ready. There's an example of some code that's been brought in in that way. And here's an, here's an example of a um, simulation that's been brought in into Houdini and colorized by basically giving each reagent a different color and shaping, so like powers and gamma sort of thing and multipliers to sort of make it have a nice look about it. Um, here's another example that's a bit more sort of bubbly wave fronty. And this is one of my favorite things I've discovered, which is really totally bizarre. Dots, initially if this starts from dots, they'll um, just sort of oscillate or whatever, and then some of them become worms, the worms you can see. And then um, as the worms get 
hit by dot by moving solitons, the end, the tips of the worms start to oscillate and then produce these trains of um, of solitons that all follow each other in this weird following, and the path sort of adheres to itself, so you can see it's got this wicked sort of folding on itself shape. Really just a strange experimental thing. But um, uh, there's a 25 minute long video of that on YouTube on my channel if you want to go and check it out. It's colored differently, but it's the same thing. And finally, um, this is just something, another one that was, I thought was really cool, uh, sort of like Tron light cycles or something like that. These, these solitons zoom across the space, leaving a trail, the sort of cyan color of the trail, that's the history reagent. And what you're seeing in the purpley ready bit is the, um, is the wave reagent. So that's, that's it for my talk today. Go and check out the repo if you're interested in playing with it. I'm really interested in um, things we can do with uh, reaction diffusion, and I think it's a uh, heaps fertile ground for, um, for experimenting and synthesizing things. It's like another primitive in the toolbox for synthesizing things to me. Thanks. <laughs>